Boise State Physics, First Friday Astronomy. Uh, my name is Brian Jackson. I'm a professor in the physics department here at Boise State University. Uh, these First Friday events take place on the first Friday of every month. And what we do is we invite uh, in a guest lecturer uh, to discuss their research in space science or astronomy. Um, usually these, these lectures, of course, take place in person. We're going to do them virtually over the summer and probably for the foreseeable future. But that doesn't mean we don't still have some really great guests lined up. Um, and before we just dive into that, I want to make uh, one or two comments about some of the really uh, tragic events in the last several days. Um, for me, at least, the killing of George Floyd, the government's reaction to the resulting protests have been really distressing. Um, but I have felt a little better contributing in small ways that I've been able to. Um, so I would encourage you to find some ways to support um, folks in the community here, support the Black Americans, support Black-owned villages, uh, excuse me, Black-owned stores, restaurants, as, mu as much as you can, echo the voices of people who are suffering, um, and let's, uh, let's try to help folks out here. Um, next month, we're going to have Dr. Katie Devine from the College of Idaho. She's an astronomer, a stellar astronomer, and she's going to talk about her research uh, on stellar astronomy, so I think that'll be very interesting. Uh, but tonight's guest, uh, I'm really excited about. Tonight's guest is uh, Professor J uh, James Evans of the University of Puget Sound. Uh, Professor Evans is a historian of science uh, and a physicist by training. So he has this really interesting combination of expertise, both in history uh, and science. Uh, in particular, he studies the history of ancient astronomy. And so tonight he's gonna tell us about one of the most fascinating uh, items uh, in ancient astronomy. Um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to him, Professor Evans. Thank you, Brian. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, even at uh, remote distances, um, I feel like I'm part of the, the community in Boise. So um, in the year uh, 1900, some sponge drop divers, Greeks, Greek divers from uh, the west coast of Turkey, sought some shelter from a storm that was then raging. This was near a little island called Antikythera. It's uh, in the channel between uh, the western end of Crete and this island right here, Kithera. So it's the island opposite Kithera, anti-Kithera. After a day or so, the, the storm abated, but they were in new water that they hadn't fished before. So they took some more dives to see what, if there are more sponges in the area. And they were astonished to find the remains of an ancient uh, shipwreck, which had been underwater for almost 2000 years. The next year, in uh, 1901, the wreck was excavated by a, a team led by professional archaeologists from the National Museum in Athens. This was in the period just a little bit after the invention of those giant brass uh, diving helmets and the rubberized suits. Uh, so that made it possible for divers to stay down for a longer time and go to deeper depths. It was a really dangerous way to do things, though, that the rubber hose, uh, which was the air supply, was filled by hand pumps up on the surface vessels. Uh, one of the divers was killed. Uh, a couple others were severely injured by the bins. The ship they wasn't just an ordinary merchant ship because it had a kind of remarkable cargo. In the first place, there was a big cargo of statues, both uh, marble and bronze. Most of the marbles, um, were badly corroded from being in the seawater for 2,000 years. The bronzes are in still, still in pretty good shape. You could see them if you get a chance to go to Athens. All this stuff is on exhibit in the National Archaeological Museum. So on the left, we have the so-called uh, youth of Antikythera. It's either a hero or a god. This is one of the best preserved, uh, a, a very small number of intact bronze sculptures from antiquity. And on the right, we have the uh, the head of a philosopher. There was also a lot of really beautiful art glass, uh, not your, your everyday sort of uh, dining ware that the, that the crew used, but beautiful art glass used uh, for a, a sort of an expensive clientele, I imagine. Well, one of the things brought up from the surface, from, the, from down below the surface, was a big sort of corroded mass, uh, hard and calcinated. And this was put aside in the museum. It dried out for a few months and then 
all by itself, it cracked open. And inside there were gears and inscriptions written in Greek. So there was a lot of uh, uh, interest in it almost right away. That's so it's in the newspapers of the day, uh, Greek newspapers from uh, 19, uh, 1901 and just after. Uh, a lot of speculation about what it might be. There are five principal fragments of this machine, uh, which are preserved again in Athens. This is fragment A. It's the one that contains most of the surviving gears. So the original machine maybe had 60 or so gears. We don't know for sure. 30 have survived uh, and 29 of them are in this fragment here. So one of the most uh, striking wheels is this uh, big wheel that uh, has four spokes. This is the what people today call the main solar gear. It would have turned around once in a year as you turned a crank. And there would have been a golden ball on it that represented the, the sun. Uh, most of the other gears uh, are in this same fragment. You can see bits of them peeking out from here and there. But most of them can only be seen in, uh, by the use of x-rays. Here's another fragment. This is fragment C. And it's remarkable for containing parts of two circular scales. Um, this one is the zodiac scale, which is divided into 12 zodiac signs, and each of those divided into 30 degrees. And the outer scale is a calendar scale, the Egyptian calendar. It had 12 months, uh, all 30 days long, and then five days tacked on at the end of the year, a 365-day year. It's kind of an interesting calendar because the ancient Greek calendars were very complicated lunisolar calendars. Sometimes you had 12 months, sometimes you had 13 months in the year. So the, uh, the dates of fixed events like the summer solstice slosh back and forth with respect to that calendar. So Greek astronomers adopted the Egyptian calendar as kind of an artificial astronomical calendar, which functioned alongside the whatever local calendar people might be using. This right here is a, an inscription of, of a star calendar, and I'll talk about it a little bit more. And the course of the wreck, it got knocked out of place, and it's now uh, sitting on top of the, uh, the calendar and zodiac scale. So you can only see the remainder of these two scales by, again, using x-rays. So uh, this first excavation in uh, 1901 uh, isn't the only one that took place. In the 1970s, Jacques Cousteau took his ship Calypso back to the island. And he got permission from the Greek authorities to do another examination. So here you can see one of his divers using a like, kind of a vacuum cleaner to suck up sediment, which was then filtered to try to find pieces. Uh, one of, this is not a scientific way to excavate, a highly, uh, highly disparaged by modern archeologists because you lose all information about just exactly where in the wreck a particular uh, item was found. One of the things these guys did found, though, find though was a, a bunch of coins. Uh, and these came from different cities in Asia Minor. And coins are helpful because often they can be closely dated. Whenever there's a new ruler, he'll change uh, the bust that put a bust of himself on the front of the coin. So you can often date these things reliably. So these coins found in 1976 are a, a, good, a good piece of dating of evidence for the, the shipwreck itself. And uh, just in the last few years, there's been a third excavation uh, done by a team from Woods Hole. Uh, there's a team at Woods Hole Laboratory in Massachusetts, which specializes in underwater archaeology. As far as I know, no new pieces of the Antikythera mechanism have been found, although they have found a lot of other interesting things. The Again, right at the beginning, in the early 1900s, there was a lot of speculation about just what sort of a thing this machine was. But the real breakthrough came uh, in 1974 when Derek de Sola Price published a famous paper called Gears from the Greeks. So Price made use of x-rays. Uh, these are some of his x-rays. And you can see the wheels are all just jumbled on top of each other. You can't tell what's in front and what's in back. So it's hard to use them. And here's one of his drawings in which he meticulously, with an ink pen, traced in the teeth of all the wheels he could see. Um, the exact number of teeth on each wheel turns out to be really important because astronomical cycles 
try out to be uh, represented by meshing gears. For example, 235 months by the moon is the same amount of time as 19 years by the sun. So you could recognize, you could represent a loony solar cycle by, by wheels. And the teeth number gives you something, uh, some sort of hint about what the function of a, a wheel might have been. Price published a, a reconstruction of the details of the mechanism, re reproducing the gear train as best he could. So he discovered a lot that people still think was correct, that the machine represented the motion of the sun and the moon around the zodiac, for example. But there are many, many other features of his proposed gear train, which have since been corrected. So, you know, it's a pioneering study. He got a lot right, uh, but he got a lot wrong too. And in the last few decades, there's been a revival of interest and a lot of his work has had to be redone. In the uh, 1990s and early 2000s, a number of different people started working again on the anti kiefer mechanism. This is Michael Wright, who was a curator of uh, mechanics at the Science Museum in London. And uh, he became fascinated with the anti kiefer mechanism. Uh, here he is posing in his workshop with his own reconstructed model. Um, one of the things he discovered was that the, the lunar ball, the little silver ball that would have represented the moon was half silvered and half black. And it would have rotated around in the course of the month. So as the moon went around the zodiac, you would also be able to see the changing uh, appearance of a, you know, the changing phase of the moon. Uh, around 2006, a big international team applied a kind of big science uh, approach. And this team, you can see 19 members on their first paper, very showy pu paper published in Nature. This team had experts in uh, astronomy and physics, um, computer imaging people, um, classical philologists who could, were good at handling the Greek, a multinational team from uh, Wales, England, uh, Greece and uh, one of here's uh, their reconstruction from that 2006 publication of what the thing would have looked like when it was intact. The anti kiefer mechanism is about the size of a you know, good sized shoebox, and the uh, the front face was dominated by those two circular scales, the zodiac and Egyptian calendar scales, and uh, there were inscriptions all around it, which was a star calendar. I'll show you a bit of that later. The back face had two large dials. The top one told time in a Greek calendar, a loony solar calendar. So we've got the Egyptian calendar on the front and this Greek calendar on the back. And the bottom dial was an eclipse predictor. There were protective covers, um, which sometimes are called covers or front and back door. And these were also engraved with inscriptions. And these served to protect the mechanism when it wasn't in use. And so all of the blank space on the interiors of the covers and on the front and back faces was covered with inscriptions in Greek, which described the details of the mechanism and what phenomena it represented. It was kind of like the owner's manual. So this big team published a second uh, reconstruction, which differed from prices in, in quite a few details. Here's a, a, a real physical model. Um, made by the team at uh, Thessaloniki University, uh, Aristotle University Thessaloniki in Greece. So here you can see the golden ball, which would have represented the, the sun. And as you cranked the dial on the side here, this would slowly have moved around and it would indicate not only the place of the sun and the zodiac, but also the date in the Egyptian calendar. And then there was a, a cap that rotated around carrying the the moon around the zodiac in a month. So this would go around much more quickly. And I, as I mentioned, the lunar ball rotated to show you changing phases. Not too bad. The back face was uh, dominated by these two big spiral dials. Again, the top one told time in a loony solar calendar and the bottom one was an eclipse predictor. We'll look at these in more detail. This uh, little supplementary dial is kind of interesting because it told you where you were in the four year cycle of Olympic games. So um, one of these little quadrants represents the year that has the Olympics and the others give you some of the other local uh, athletic games in Greece. 
Now, that doesn't mean that the maker was just a, a sports fan because the Olympic cycle actually had an important role in, um, in um, Greek chronology. So there wasn't any universally agreed on scheme for counting the years. In every city of any size, who usually told what year you, in, you were in by saying, oh, it was the year that Callisthenes was mayor of Athens, Archon of Athens, or later in the Roman imperial period, it was the fourth year of the reign of Augustus. So there was no count that went continuously and that didn't start over whenever you had a new ruler. The Olympic, Olympic cycle provided that. So you could say that, oh, such and such an event took place in the third year of the 72nd Olympiad. So I, you counted by these four year Olympic cycles. So that, that's an, again, an important part of regular chronology. Let's look now at a few of the details of things that are actually represented on the mechanism. So first I need to tell you a little bit about a, a parapegma or a star calendar. These were very common in Greece and often they were in, inscribed on stones. Remember that each city had its own calendar with different names of, of the months, different conventions for when the year begins. And each, each year could either be 12 months or 13. So you couldn't expect to know when the summer solstice is going to be just by the name and date of the month. So a, a technology that helped you get around that was this parapegma. So here we have a list of inscriptions in Greek and holes drilled next to each um, line of writing. So each hole represents a day. And you, somebody had the job of taking a little wooden peg and moving it along from one hole to the next each day. So this could be set up in the marketplace in a town and a passerby comes by and says, sees the Marcus next to this line. Oh, our tourist rises in the morning. So this is the day when you would see Arcturus, a bright star, um, rising in the east just before dawn. And then you would know what time of year it is. So there's a, a parapegma inscribed on the uh, anti. It's a very common thing in everyday life. And here's the way it works. So on the front face, in the blank space around the corners, there are, are lines of writing. So here are the preserved portions of the parapegma. The black bits are things that can still be read today. The red bits used to be read, and we know what they said because people published papers about them decades ago, but they're no longer legible because too much cleaning of the mechanism has destroyed that part of the surface. So also along the uh, ecliptic, there are little key letters. For example, you can see that uh, if we take a look, Right here, there are two key letters. They're delta, and, excuse me, gamma and delta. And there they are blown up. So when the little solar marker, which represents the position of the sun, happened to be next to the gamma, you could look down in the parapegma and see what celestial event was going to take place. For example, when it reaches the letter pi, Gemini uh, begins to rise in the morning. So that, that's a neat feature. You can tell uh, not only where the sun is in the zodiac, but which stars are going to be visible and whether they're rising in the morning or setting in the morning, that kind of thing. I mentioned that the moon goes around uh, as you turn the main uh, crank. But as we know, the moon speeds up and slows down as it goes around the zodiac. And the Greeks knew about this. They represented it by letting the moon go around in a little epicycle as the epicycle goes around the earth. The ancient Babylonians knew it too, and they represented it completely different way, not geometrically. They imagined that the speed of the moon gets faster and slower in a kind of linear zigzag fashion, fashion in the course of a month. So we, today we would think of it as due to what we call Kepler motion, right? The, as the moon goes around the earth, it goes in an elliptical orbit, obeying the law of areas, equal areas, equal times. So different mathematical strategies for representing it. It was discovered by uh, uh, Tony Freeth and his collaborators, published in 2006. There was a very clever mechanism for representing the non-uniformity of the moon's motion. It's a very clever little four gear assembly that rides on top of another gear. And it allows you to have uniform motion in 
and non-uniform motion come out. It's very clever. Nobody had any idea that the Greeks knew about devices like this. So um, here is the, uh, the input motion is the turning of this uh, wheel five, and it engages this wheel K1, they're both gears, and K1 has a little peg in it. And uh, on top of K1 is wheel K2, but it's mounted off center on wheel K1. And wheel K2 has a little slot in it. So the, the peg from the one wheel engages the slot in the other wheel, and the two wheels turn about different centers. So the peg goes around uniformly, but the wheel with a slot is gonna speed up and slow down because it's mounted off center. It's an amazing thing. Now we have a bunch of ancient Greek works uh, that describe gears, but the things they describe are all pretty simple. Like Hero of Alexandria describes an odometer that you could put on your chariot, see how far you went. And then nobody ever mentions anything like this. So the machine is much more intricate than anybody would have thought possible. Um, from the surviving Greek texts on gears. So one thing this shows us is the inequality in the way history of technology and history of a science are uh, preserved. So for the pure sciences, like astronomy, mathematics, uh, physics, things like that, we have complete texts preserved in their entirety. But for technology, there's not so much. So a lot of the technological stuff was passed down from a master craftsman to a apprentice and a lot of it was never really recorded. So again, having an actual artifact could greatly increase your knowledge about the history of technology. Now, the ancient Greeks did have different ways to represent the non-uniformity of the motion of the sun or the moon. One way in a mathematical theory would be to imagine that the sun, for example, goes around the earth in the course of the year, traveling at uniform speed, but the sun's circle is off center from the earth. There's the earth, here's the center of the circle. That gives you an apparent variation in speed. As viewed from the earth, the sun would appear to be going more rapidly here when it's near the, the perigee. A different way to do it, uh, and this gives you a, well, here you can see that you get a non-uniformity of motion. So observe from point C, the center of the circle, the sun appears to have gone through this angle alpha. But observed from the Earth, the sun would have appeared to go through a larger angle. And the difference between the two is this little angle Q. The Greeks had a second way of doing it. A second version of the theory involved concentric circles to the Earth. And as the sun goes around the Earth, it actually rises on a little epicycle. The sun goes around this way on the epicycle while the center of the epicycle is going around the Earth. And both these motions are completed at the same rate. So angle alpha and angle beta are equal. So there's a big fight in antiquity about which one was the truth. It turns out they're mathematically equivalent. You can prove that they give you exactly the same motion. But some Greek philosophers thought this one was more likely because it gets the same job done with one motion instead of two. Others like this one better, thinking that it was more likely that the sun was situated centrally with respect to the earth. But everybody knew that these were equal to each other. Amazingly, this pin and slot device gives you a uh, motion that's almost equivalent to either of these other two theories I just showed you about but the astronomical writers breathe not a word about it. Um, it's an almost equivalence because what this does is give you the correct motion and angle compared to the theories that the astronomers like, but it suppresses the motion and depth. So you get uniform, you get motion around the earth on a concentric circle, but a variable speed. Again, uh, it's a complete surprise the ancients had talked about the equivalence of an epicycle to a off-centered circle, but nobody ever mentioned the pin and slot. And I think that the astronomers really wouldn't have liked it too much because Claudius Ptolemy tells us in one of his works that he doesn't approve of the way these models uh, are made 
because they concern themselves with the appearances and don't show you the underlying reality. So I think if Ptolemy could have opened up the Antikythera mechanism, he would have been appalled because of instead of realistic off-centered circles and epicycles, the physics he believed in, he would have seen these non-physical pins and slots, right? So again, the craft tradition was different from the tradition of the, the pure scientists. Four guys, uh, Tony Freeth, Alexander Jones, John Steele, and Yanis Bitsakas published a, another paper uh, just a few years later, explicating uh, more details about these two big spiral displays on the back of the mechanism. And I'd like to say just a little bit about those. So the top dial tells time in a Greek lunisolar calendar. This turns out to be pretty interesting because remember each Greek city-state of any size had a different calendar with different month names. So the names of the months can give you some hints about uh, where it was made or who it was made for. And it turns out that the month names suggest a calendar in the family of calendars belonging to Corinth. But Corinth is a city on the isthmus between the mainland and the lower peninsula of Greece. But it had a bunch of colonies. Syracuse in uh, Italy was, uh, Sicily was one of its colonies. There were some cities in Northwestern Greece. So some calendar in that family, probably not the calendar of Syracuse, uh, even though that would be tempting because that was Archimedes' hometown. So the red bits are the actually preserved inscriptions and the blue bits are uh, reconstructed because obviously the months repeat from one year to the next. So as a dial went around, it showed you what month you were in. And uh, I mentioned the Olympic game dial uh, a little bit earlier. The bottom spiral is an eclipse predictor. So each of these little blocks represents a, uh, a month. And the months which have inscriptions in them are months for which an eclipse is predicted. And the empty months are months with no eclipses. And the eclipses are made, uh, predictions are made by means of a eclipse cycle, which is today called the Saros, is a Babylonian cycle. It's 223 months long. And um, that means that if you had an eclipse this month, 223 months from now, that's a little bit more than 18 years from now, there would be another eclipse with very similar circumstances. But the time of day would be off by about eight hours. So there's a subsidiary dial, which is inscribed with nothing or with the figure for eight or 16, showing you how many hours you're supposed to add to the eclipse times that are given in the box, depending on where you are after one or two sorrow cycles. Well, what was something like this for? Some, uh, Alexander Jones has described it as a cosmos in a box, that most of the phenomena uh, known to Greek science, Greek astronomy, are represented there. Um, no dials representing the planets have been discovered. That part of the apparatus doesn't seem to have survived. But we're pretty sure that besides the sun and the moon, there would have been little balls representing the five known planets. And the reason we think that is because in the preserved inscriptions, the planets are mentioned by name and also planetary phenomena. So probably there was uh, some of that too. So it showed you the motion of the sun and the moon around the zodiac, the changing phase of the moon, probably the motions of the planets, uh, including the retrograde motions. It told time in two calendars, the a Greek lunisolar solar calendar and the Egyptian solar calendar. And it predicted eclipses and it predicted the heliacal risings and settings of the stars in the course of the year. So that's most of the astronomical phenomena that the ancients knew about. Um, so what was something like this for? Well, you know, these days there really isn't any one central science. Um, we have dozens of sciences and each of them is divided into hundreds of subspecialties and no one science can claim to have a central place. But in antiquity, it wasn't so. There was a central science, it was astronomy, and it had connections to everything else, to mathematics, to traditional religion, to medicine, uh, to weather prediction, um, philosophy, uh, you name it. And we have hundreds of objects preserved from uh, ancient times carrying different kinds of astronomical symbolism, 
Sometimes it's purely symbolic with no function. Sometimes it does have a, a function. Here's a preserved miniature ivory sundial from Greek Egypt. Here's a coin from Roman Bithynia showing the astronomer Hipparchus seated before a celestial globe. This is a mosaic from uh, Sicily showing a uh, armillary sphere. So lots and lots of celestial imagery. Some of it could be pretty spectacular. So this is the, the Tower of the Winds as represented in an 18th century publication. But the Tower of the Winds is still there in Athens. If you get a chance to go see it, you can. It's an eight-sided building uh, built probably in the first century BC. So from around the same time as the Antikythera mechanism. It had eight sides and a, on each side there was a sculpture, a relief sculpture representing one of the wind gods. And uh, on the top, as Vitruvius tells us, there was a weather vane that turned and pointed to show you which wind god was blowing. And then each face was also adorned with a specially designed sundial. These dials all face in eight different directions. They all have to be individually uh, designed. Obviously, you never need eight sundials. You know, one would be enough. We're pretty sure that inside there was also a water clock, which would allow you an astronomical water clock, which would show you uh, which constellations were rising and so on. So you'd even be able to tell time if uh, it was cloudy. So this is not a practical thing. It has some practical functions, but is way over the top, right? It's a symbolic. It show, shows you that the designer and the patron who built this thing were celebrating human ingenuity and be able to figure out, understand the cosmos. So there's a lot going on. There are a bunch of other examples we could uh, point to. A, a nice one is an astronomy of Eudoxus. So Eudoxus was an important astronomer and geometer from around the time of Plato and Aristotle. And somebody in the second century BCE wrote out the details of Eudoxus's astronomy on whitened boards and dedicated them to a temple. Um, so we can imagine functions kind of like this too. The Antikythera mechanism represents the sense of awe, but also the celebration of human ingenuity and being able to figure out how the cosmos works. You could imagine it being used in a philosopher's astronomy classes maybe, or it could maybe was dedicated to a, a temple, something like that, hard to say. It also has a kind of affiliation with magic and wonder working. There's a Greek writer on uh, astronomy uh, named Geminus and in one of his works, he described the sub-branches of mathematical learning. For example, he divides astronomy, uh, geometry, divides mathematics first into the pure and the applied. That's kind of a platonic distinction. And under the list of branches of uh, applied mathematics is a branch of mechanics, which is called wonder working. Uh, Hero of Alexandria gives us some examples of that like mechanical singing blackbirds that work by water pressure. Or my favorite one is a, a mechanical toy temple. You build a little offering on the toy altar and light it on fire. And then through hid, hidden pipes, steam pressure causes the temple door to open and the mechanical god to come out to accept the offering. So the Antikythera mechanism was built only a hundred years or so after the invention of gears it would have been an amazing thing. You turn this one crank, all these markers go around. It shows you everything that's going on in the whole universe. So I think the Antikythera mechanism also has a kind of affiliation with this wonder working art. It probably didn't have any practical application to uh, navigation or anything like that. Uh, in just a few minutes, I would like to say a little bit about some of the research that our little group at the University of Puget Sound has been engaged in regarding the Antikythera mechanism. So I showed you that there's this clever four gear assembly that is used to represent the non-uniformity of the moon's motion. Well, the sun also appears to speed up and slow down as we go around through the year. I mean, a modern would think of the earth as going around the sun, but it makes no difference in terms of the phenomena if you think of the sun as going around the earth. Again, today we would think of it as going in an ellipse, speeding up and slowing down. 
Well, so is the motion of the sun represented in a sort of non-uniform way? Well, here is the uh, circle of the zodiac with its zodiac signs and the months of the Egyptian calendar. So these bits that are dotted are the parts that are actually preserved. So you can see we have about three zodiac signs, about 88 degrees preserved. Now, one way to represent the non-uniformity of motion would be just to put the zodiac circle off center from the sun's, uh, uh, the, put the sun's zodiac circle off center from the calendar scale. But we can see that that's not the way it was done. The two scales were right up against each other. You could have put the protractor for dividing the zodiac off center and divided the, the circles down uniformly. But we should also keep our minds open to maybe influence from a different culture. So the ancient Babylonians had a solar theory according to which the sun traveled at a fast speed through a little bit more than half of the zodiac, a speed of 30 degrees per month. And then it abruptly slowed down and traveled at a slower speed through the other part of the zodiac, 28 and an eighth degrees per, per month. So you don't know what you're gonna get before you actually examine uh, the evidence, but you should keep your mind open to different kinds of possibilities. We might suspect that something like a non-uniform division of the zodiac is going on. Because if we look carefully at the interval from the beginning of the sign of Libra to the 29th degree of Libra, that's 29 degrees, that corresponds to about 28 and a half days marked off on the calendar scale. So you have 29 degrees in 28 and a half days. But wait, we should always have more days than degrees if only uniform motion is being represented, right? There are 365 days in the year, only 360 days in the circle. So what we actually see is uh, more degrees than days. So we made a examination of, of the whole surviving bits of the scales using x-rays provided by the, the big international team uh, operating mostly out of Britain. And so the strategy is pretty easy. You just see how many degrees uh, the sun is supposed to move compared and how many days that takes. So here we've plotted the how far each zodiac mark is out of place from where it would be if only mean motion were represented. So that's a misplacement of each zodiac mark. So you can see there's a steadily rising effect. So if only uniform motion were being represented, 360 degrees in 365 days, this graph would be a horizontal straight line. So the signal is pretty strong, right? And it turns out uh, then that we think the zodiac scale was non-uniformly divided. So the months in this part of the zodiac were, the, the zodiac signs in this uh, part of the zodiac have their degree marks a little bit farther apart. That makes the sun appear to go more slowly. And in this part, they're a little bit closer together. But using it, you wouldn't re even really notice uh, unless you actually wanted to measure the lengths of the seasons or something. Um, I mentioned that nobody knows for sure how the, the planets were handled. We're pretty sure that the planets were there because of the inscriptions. It turns out that for the superior planets, the planets are farther from the, the sun, uh, farther than the sun from us, according to the Greek worldview. It's possible to get the retrograde motions of the planets using the same sort of pin and slot device. So two different teams uh, just around the same time in 2012 uh, uh, figured that out. For, for the outer, and that'd be kind of interesting because we know for sure that this pin and slot device was used to represent the non-uniform speed of the moon, it turns out that it could also represent the retrograde motions of the planets. Let me just say a word about retrograde motion. So it, if you think about the Earth in the middle here, as the planet goes around the Earth, occasionally it appears to stop and back up and go the wrong way for a short time, and then go back in the forward direction eastward again. 
So for the Greeks, this is a bit of a mystery because the planets were supposed to be divine and regular and all of that. So they represented it using an epicycle. The modern explanation for the outer planets is that when the Earth passes by Mars on the inside track, that's when we see Mars appear apparently backing up going the wrong way. So for us, the retrograde motion of the outer planets is a kind of optical illusion. It's due to the motion of the Earth. But that wasn't really widely accepted till the 16th century with Copernicus. So no, again, nobody knows for sure uh, how the motions of the planets were represented. It's possible that for the outer planets, they could have these motions could have been represented with the same pin and slot device that we know was used for the uh, non-uniform motion of the moon. For the inner planets, you have to do something just a little bit different. Here's a little movie showing how this works. So uh, this represents that main solar wheel. And here we have a combination of four wheels, uh, one of them mounted off center on the other one. And so the, the yellow tab represents the direction of Mars. So I'm gonna turn this main disc around by hand that represents the motion of the sun and the course of the year. But I'd like you to keep your eye on Mars, which is the yellow disc. So the sun's going around, move, oh, Mars is retrograded. Mars retrograded again. So you really can produce the retrograde motion of the planets with the, this four gear pin and slot device. Okay, one last thing. Let's see, we have just a, maybe a few more minutes, uh, another five minutes or so. Um, I'd like to stop so people will be able to ask questions if they'd like. One of the big questions people have is when the heck was the thing made? Um, there are a bunch of different approaches you can use. Radiocarbon dating of the ship's timbers, but that only tells you when the trees were felled that were used to make the ship. Um, the styles of pottery found on board and the coins found in association with the wreck. And that'll give you some information about when the wreck was, right? If there are no coins later than 60 BC, well, maybe it sank shortly after 60 BC, right? That doesn't tell you anything for sure about the date of the mechanism. It could have been brand spanking new, or it could have been old. Most of the marble statues were new, but the bronze statues were 200 years old. So that again, the dating of the artifacts on the ship don't necessarily tell you about when the mechanism was built. Sometimes uh, people try to use the forms of the Greek letters and the inscriptions on the mechanism because as the centuries went by, the shapes of the letters changed a little bit. People began to add those serifs uh, to the, the letters and so on. Uh, but this is a slow change and it takes a hundred years for a, much of a change to be noticed and it doesn't change everywhere at the same time. And you could have three generations of engravers working together in the same city using slightly different engraving styles. So this, that approach only gives you, you know, like a, a range of maybe 100 and 125 years or something. So astronomical considerations are the best approach for a kind of secure astronomical dating. And most of the information uh, that'd be suitable for dating comes from the eclipse inscriptions. So here's an example of one of those little engravings that shows you some stuff about an eclipse. The sigma tells you it's an eclipse of Selene, the moon. And this tells you, uh, this is a num numeral 12. It takes place in the 12th hour of the day. So we have the months at which eclipses take place, but also the times of day. One of the things our group did was to try to make use of e uh, eclipse data the times of day to find a, a suitable epoch, the starting year for the eclipse dial. And it turns out that the full moon of the very first cell on the eclipse cycle best fits uh, a sorrow cycle that began on May 12th, minus 204, that's 205 BCE. So we think the eclipse cycle uh, started in 205 or so, you could, it could be maybe one sorrows later, 18 years later, or two sorrows later, 36 years later, but the eclipses would be predicted with less and less accuracy. 
So probably it was meant to represent eclipses starting from this period around 205. Now, a lot of people don't think it was built quite that early. It's possible that for some reason of convenience, the, uh, the maker of the machine adopted a, a starting date that was some centuries earlier than his, his own lifetime. It's hard to say, people so, uh, argue that out. So we can be pretty sure about the starting year for the eclipse predictor, but whether that really means it was uh, built to start, that it was actually built that same year is hard to say. So uh, also uh, our analysis shows that the, the technique that was used to predict the times of the eclipses was probably based on Babylonian style uh, uh, zigzag patterns rather than epicycles or deference. So we think the person who worked out the eclipse predictions wasn't a user of trigonometry or of geometrical models, but used a sort of Greek adaptation of Babylonian style predictive um, astronomy. Okay, well, and it turns out that you, this theory matches the uh, inscribed eclipse times pretty well. So here you have the uh, in gray, the predicted, predicted times for the eclipse, according to our reconstruction, based on these Babylonian style lunisolar um, parameters. And the black lines are the actually uh, engraved times of eclipses. So it's a pretty good fit. And the fit is better for this theory than it would be for a lunar theory based on epicycles. Okay, so that's kind of a lot of stuff. I'd like to stop for a while so people could ask some questions. It's been really fun to have a chance to talk about uh, one of my favorite things in the history of science. If you're interested in uh, more, I'd recommend Googling um, Michael Wright um, and anti keith mechanism. You can find a short film on uh, YouTube. So it has the science uh, journalist, uh, Joe Marchand. She's interviewing Michael Wright, asking him questions about his machine. You see him there in this workshop with the machine he built himself and cranking it around. That's pretty fun to watch. Uh, and uh, there's a, a book by Alexander Jones published just a couple of years ago called A Portable Cosmos. It's kind of a challenging read, but the book is aimed at non-specialists. And he does a great job of going back and forth between astronomical phenomena, the cultural setting, and, and the details of what people find on the mechanism. So it's, it's really quite a good book, even though bits of it can be sort of hard going. Okay, so thanks so much, Brian, for letting me uh, talk to the group. Shall we see if uh, people might have questions? Yeah, great, that was awesome. Thanks so much, Jim. Yeah, I have a couple of questions here for you. Uh, let's see. Um, are there, what are the big uh, questions remaining about the, the mechanism? Like uh, what, what things do we not understand still? And do we, do we have any hope of of answering the questions by recovering additional pieces or additional historical documentation or something. Mm -hmm. I think you know one of the the biggest issues is you know just when was it made? Uh, it kind of matters for trying to understand the history of Greek technology, and uh, we'd like our our team would like it to be built within a few decades of 205 BCE. For other people like uh, Jones, uh, that seems a little too early. He'd like it to have been built just shortly before the shipwreck. He'd like it to be brand new, practically. Um, and people have different arguments. And um, so that's not quite resolved. And maybe we won't really ever know for sure. We can't ever know for sure how the planets were represented unless the divers actually find some more material. So that, that would be a, a neat thing if that happened. I, say, I think those are the two big, really, uh, unresolved issues. That's fascinating. Um, uh, given how, how complicated this device is, uh, how long would it have taken a, some craftsmen to design and build it? Uh, is this like several years worth of work? Or is this something that someone could have done in a couple of months? I think it would, it's, it's a big challenge. When you see the thing in Athens, the remains of it, you're impressed by how small and delicate it looks. 
so it's not a big burly machine. It probably wasn't used hard and used, you know, used every day. It's kind of a demonstration machine. It would have taken a, a mechanic who was really, really good. And probably this mechanic would have had to have been working in close association with the, with the astronomer uh, philosopher who designed the thing. Stuff that I would have thought would be really impossible uh, to do by hand, Michael Wright can do just like that. So um, if you, again, you could look at his, uh, his, his own reconstruction of what he thinks it was like. We don't agree with all the details necessarily, but it's an amazing piece of work. His machine is actually dissectable. You can take pieces of it apart and put them back together. Um, but he can do stuff in a couple of minutes that I would have thought would take somebody all day. So I think there's kind of almost a limit to how good at some particular craft a person can get by working at it um, long enough. So I would have thought it you know, would be years of work, but maybe somebody like Michael Wright could build it in a couple of months. I don't know. There yeah, probably never Michael were very many of these things because they would have, have taken a long time, been very expensive. Yeah, and so that's a, a, a leads to a related question. If um, it, it seems like this is the sort of thing that someone would have had to practice at, like someone didn't just this wasn't this couldn't have been the first one of the, of its kind, um, and so it's surprising that there aren't I don't know many of these you know you, you don't see some sort of evolution of these kinds of machines or or do we do we have things that are like this but much simpler? The um, a couple of things to say about that. We're pretty sure that people were making things like this by around the time of Archimedes. He died in 212 when the Romans took Syracuse. Um, because a couple generations later, Cicero, the Roman writer, um, described, in a, it's in a philosophical dialogue set generations before his own time, but there's a discussion of the amazing device of Archimedes. And so ancient literature has lots of references to this. So in the old days, Historians didn't tend to believe it because it seemed too marvelous. But after people discovered and understood the Antikythera mechanism, now it seems more believable. So it's likely that people started making things like this in the, you know, the late 200s BCE, um, not all that long after the invention of gears. And uh, so there's probably a cont continuous tradition of making them from you know, the late 200s up to about 150. CE, because Ptolemy, the astronomer, mentions them. And we know the Posidonia Stoic philosopher made one uh, around 70 or so. So I think, you know, there were more than just this one. Uh, there was a tradition 450 years long of making them. It's just complete luck that we happen to have a major part of one of them preserved from this, this shipwreck. Now, from a quite a bit later, around 500 AD or CE, we have uh, a much simpler device uh, embedded in a, su a portable sundial, a, a thing with a crank that has moon and sun markers that go around. So we have that, but that's from, gosh, that's 600 years later. So we, we have two data points <laughs> and the distance between them is pretty big. That's fascinating. Okay, I think we got one more question. Um, how likely is it, do you think that there are additional catches, caches of artifacts or even maybe important documents that would sort of help to tell the story of, of Antikythera or, or any other sort of really, you know, mysterious puzzle about sort of ancient Greece, uh, science or astronomy. You, you know, you never know till you, you know, find things. Um, until pretty recently, we thought there was only one surviving celestial globe from ancient times. It's a big marble globe. Uh, carried by a statue of Atlas. It's in the Archaeological Museum in Naples. Uh, but in the last couple of decades, two ancient, much smaller uh, metal globes, uh, celestial globes, came to light. So that's something that's happened just in the last few decades. So you never know what might happen. Um, we, when um, Sharon, uh, What's her name? The uh, astronomer, uh, historian of astronomer who published in the 1970s an inventory of all the known Greek and Roman sundials. Um, she was only able to um, catalog like 250 or so. But now people have 
found 600. Uh, a lot of them hidden away in museums and stuff that she wasn't aware of at the time. So those are two examples uh, of the way stuff can, can pop up. The trouble is that, you know, things made of metal, you know, often later they were melted down and used for other things. Um, so on sundials, most of the gnomons are gone because if they were iron, they rusted away. If they were bronze, they were melted down and used for something else in the, in the Middle Ages. So you, you do have, besides accidental destruction, the sort of deliberate destruction and reuse that takes place, which has not been a good thing for scientific instruments, which would have been delicate and few in number to begin with. So you never know, stuff could still turn up. Uh, it would be great if it did, but we'd have to get lucky, I guess. Yeah, I, I wonder if there is some sort of secret vault in the Vatican or something where they've got some cache of ancient Greek astronomical instruments or something. <laughs> it could be, you know, a lot of times there are museums which don't, they don't know everything they have. There are things locked away that haven't been looked at in a long time. Um, so something like that could turn up, but I think it's much more likely if any other instrument like this pops up, it'll be from a new archeological find. Well, that's great. Well, thanks so much. Thanks so much, Jim, again. And we had, we had well, a thanks for, of folks who attended. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry you can't see them, but they're there, I promise. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to have a chance to talk about the antique ether mechanism. It's, it's really fun. And thanks for inviting me. For sure. Thanks so much, everyone. Um, and again, next uh, event will be July 3rd, Dr. Katie Devine. I'm um, talking about stellar astronomy. Uh, have a good weekend, everyone. Take care. And let me.